Let me get Thanks started for with me. perhaps a tone of discussions with your clients uh, when it came to launching this. Congratulations on the launch, but what was the tone given the broader Chinese crackdown? Well, a futures contract like the uh, MSCI China A50 uh, Connect Index uh, futures, it's even more important in times of high volatility and, and the divergence of views as to uh, you know, the value of securities. And therefore, uh, there is always a, a, an opportune time and a not an opportune time to do a, a launch like this. I think that this is, uh, this is the right moment. Uh, we've been waiting for this for quite a number of years in our partnership with the Hong Kong exchanges. And I think this uh, futures contract is gonna serve investors well and it's been a, a key missing link and the ecosystem of China exposures that have been built in Hong Kong. Yeah, that took two years to get approval, right? So what role did the regulators crack down on Chinese stocks have in actually making this happen? Did it accelerate the pace of approval? I think over the last few years, there has been quite a lot of uh, discussion between the regulators of Hong Kong and mainland China about the best way to collaborate in uh, harmonizing their uh, the flow of information to ensure that these uh, index futures will be properly structured, properly trading, and not abused uh, by anybody. So that took a little bit of time uh, to uh, get done. Uh, we patiently waited, and the time has arrived that, uh, that these futures contracts can come. And this is one of the big demands that uh, institutional investors around the world have had in terms of uh, their exposure management and their risk management uh, in, the, uh, in the Asia market. So, so having these futures contracts sitting side by side with the Stock Connect program it will be very beneficial for uh, foreign investors. Henry, there are a lot of investors that say now that Chinese assets are uninvestable for them because they can't work out how to adequately price or discount for regulatory risk and volatility. Do you get that feedback and, and, and what would you say to that criticism? There's been a lot of talk about that uh, for sure, uh, but there's always been a lot of talk about that with every emerging market in the world. There's been a time in which uh, Indian shares have been called uninvestable and, and there was a time in my in my uh, distant past in which Mexican shares were called uninvestable because of various actions by, uh, by the federal government uh, in those, or the central government in those countries. We have seen uh, the uh, regulatory compliance wave in China happen every three, four, or five years. And obviously the markets have sell off at the time, but very quickly afterwards, the markets have recovered uh, and uh, gone to, uh, to new heights. So uh, I think we got to look at this process that the Chinese regulators are going through in the prism of the last uh, 10 years and also across other markets in the world. Uh, in, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of China in terms of uh, lack of compliance, of lack of regulatory oversight. So they're now exerting their regulatory oversight. So we criticize them on the other, on the other side as well. Uh, clearly, you know, we have to see how it all shakes out. But I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that you know countries go through periods like this. Uh, there is no country that is exempt uh, about this, including Western countries. Does the nature of the the regulatory crackdown, the volatility of Chinese markets, and what authorities are trying to do there, does it change the the tone and also the timing of discussions and approvals? I'm wondering if you know approvals get a lot quicker, are they sped up? You know, when there is this sort of regulatory uh, attention being paid? I think there has to be some effect of that uh, in uh, in times of volatility, for example, uh, like this one. It's even more important, as I said, to have the, the right exposure tools and risk management tools and aging tools uh, for the market. Uh, but I think this, uh, this whole process about approving the, uh, the launch of an Asia futures in Hong Kong has uh, been long, long in coming. So uh, it was much more of a secular uh, perspective than, a, uh, than a, at the moment in time. We have been working on it for the better part of four years. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, it, it came down to the two regulators and the exchanges making sure that this was uh, properly uh, uh, structured. 
uh, and, uh, and, and of service to the, uh, to the global community. So, uh, as I said, you know, there has been uh, a missing link here in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong has developed a great ecosystem of ETFs and obviously the, the cash market through the Connect program into, uh, into Shanghai and Shenzhen. There, there is, uh, the, the Hong Kong is the largest uh, structured products market in the world, including uh, exposure to China, uh, and obviously a great trading center for the yuan. So uh, the big missing link was the, uh, the derivatives market. So we have been, uh, you know, working with, with the regulators and the exchange to, uh, to get to that point in building this ecosystem that uh, all of it together is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm. So, uh, so we're very happy that that is uh, taking place now. Henry, let me turn to crypto because you have said in the past that you are talking to experts about developing some cryptocurrency indices and products. Do you know at this point what crypto assets you're focusing on? We're still exploring a variety of options and talking to a number of partners, but we're very bullish on digital assets and the blockchain technology associated with it, uh, obviously including cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think they have a role to play in the world. And, uh, and we, we're looking at that. We're looking at it from the point of view of a direct exposure to the various types of cryptocurrencies. That would be one example. But we're also looking at the, uh, at the uh, climate change aspect of, of, uh, of mining and the like, and also at the uh, disruption that this could cause in other parts of the uh, fintech world. So, uh, so we're looking at all of that. And it's too early to tell at this point what uh, the right products will be. But uh, obviously, uh, we will be announcing something in, in, uh, in due course. Henry, you spoke about environmental implications. Are there plans to add more, more uh, tools and platforms so that investors can get that ESG exposure? Well, overall, at MSCI, the uh, climate change is one of the biggest focus and the largest area of investment in our firm. Uh, we believe that what needs to happen in the next few years, you know, couple of decades, is a total reconstruction of the global economy from reliance on fossil fuels to reliance on renewable energy. That's going to create enormous winners and losers in the global capital markets as the economy adjusts to that reality. And therefore, having the right tools to understand what parts of your portfolio are going to be benefit benefited from this uh, for example, decarbonizing companies or green technology or renewable energy companies, and what parts of your portfolio will be uh, will be bearing the brunt of, of, of all these issues. So uh, I think those are uh, coming very soon. Uh, most people think that we have 20, 30 years to adjust to this uh, new reality. Uh, but as you know, markets mm -hmm. are discounting mechanisms, and that is already happening and taking place.